Next, Broadway gives hope to a nation in despair. Poor as everybody was in the Depression, they could go and see a world where men were in tuxedos and women were in gorgeous gowns. Cole Porter, the Gershwins, and Rogers and Hart, it's all on Broadway, the American musical. Hello, I'm Julie Andrews. Here at the Schubert Theatre, the anthem of the Depression was first performed. Brother, can you spare a dime? From the crash in 1929 to the outbreak of World War II, the Broadway musical kept the troubles of the nation at bay. Along with glamorous stars such as Fred Astaire and Gene Kelly, the musical theater offered political satire and folk opera, bringing hope and comic relief to these desperate times. In an era of yearning dreams, Broadway offered an effervescent antidote to America's darkest days. was a depression, you know. Everybody was trying to make a living. To be working was the main thing. To survive was the main thing. We weren't thinking so much of the art of the theater, believe me. Everybody was working for minimum. And it wasn't altogether bad because people did shows that they wouldn't have done had it been a normal time. The shows in the 20s were escapist things, you know. My first musical that I ever saw was a thing called High Jinks, which is senseless. And most of the musicals of that time didn't reflect life at all. It was a, a kind of an oopsie whoopsie view of life. But when the Depression came, that changed everything. In the kinds of shows that were done, there is much more social commentary. There's much more relationship to the bad times. And I think you get that in a song like Brother Can You Spare a Dime. I was working on a sketch for a Broadway review, Americana. On stage, we had men in old soldiers' uniforms waiting around. It needed a song. Yip. Harburg. They used to tell me I was building a dream, and so I followed the mob. When there was earth to plow or guns to bear, I was always there, right on the job. While most they popular songs still wanted to I pretend that life is just a bowl of cherries, Broadway in the 30s was now open to experiments in form and content. When Bing Crosby recorded Brother Can You Spare a Dime, the doleful Broadway ballad took the hit parade by surprise. Once I built a railroad, now it's done. Brother, can you spare a dime? This song spoke to the hearts and to the minds and to the emotions uh, and thoughts of everybody who lived during that depression. It became the anthem of the early 30s. And at one point it was banned from the radio because it was too potent. But essentially what it was saying was, we built the country, why can't we share in its wealth? The music publishers were total censors of every popular song that came out. Because if you couldn't get it through the music publisher, you couldn't get it out in the streets. And uh, they wanted only one thing, love songs and escape songs. The way this got through that censorship thing was because it was in a Broadway show. Broadway was always the bastion of freedom uh, for artists in the United States. Oh, say, don't you remember the 
they call me Al It was Al all the time Say, don't you remember I'm your pal Buddy, can you spare a A song is the pulse of a nation's heart, a fever chart of its health. Are we at peace? Are we in trouble? Do we feel beautiful? Are we violent? Listen to our songs. Yip Harburg. In 1930, a brassy 21-year-old talent first stepped into the spotlight. She would become the emblem of Broadway, the woman who could hold a note as long as the Chase Manhattan Bank. Hit it, babe. Ethel Merman. She had a voice like a trumpet, and you could hear every word she said. She had a kind of um, good humor on the stage. She was uh, larger than life. Hang it up! Hang it up! Hang it up! Yeah! She was born Ethel Zimmerman to Scottish-German parents in Astoria, Queens, and started singing in her church choir. She never took voice lessons, Instead, learned shorthand and worked as a stenographer at BK Vacuum Booster Break. After work, she sang in clubs and ended up on the vaudeville circuit where she changed her name to fit the marquee. Her big break came when she was cast in Girl Crazy, which featured music and lyrics by George and Ira Gershwin. What struck George and Ira as riotous was the fact that when Ira wrote additional lyrics, I took them down in shorthand. I didn't see what was so funny. What could have been more natural? I'd been a secretary, hadn't I? Ethel Merman. October 14, 1930, was opening night at the Alvin Theater. Ethel Merman's first number was the eighth song of the evening. No one had ever heard anything like her. I got rhythm, I got music, I got my man who could ask for anything more. I got daisies in green pastures, I got my man who could ask for anything more. No man trouble, I don't mind him, but you won't find him. The audience went berserk. And at intermission, George Gershwin visited Merman in her dressing room. Ethel, he asked, do you know what you're doing? No, I replied. Well, he advised me, never go near a singing teacher and never forget your shorthand. The first production to open on Broadway in the 1930s was also a Gershwin show, a reworking of an anti-war satire called Strike Up the Band. 
The original had closed out of town in Philadelphia in 1927. But with the onset of the Great Depression, a musical comedy that poked fun at politics was now welcome on Broadway. The success of Strike Up the Band led the Gershwin brothers and writers George S. Kaufman and Maury Riskind to write a new show that was as funny as the government, but not nearly as dangerous. Of the I Sing satirized the American political system with a sing-song patter reminiscent of Gilbert and Sullivan. I saw of the I Sing so many times, I can't tell you when I first saw it. Nobody ever did satire on politics and got away with it. I mean, you don't know what those musicals were like in those days. People came on in groups and they sang a song and they told a joke and they went off and that was a book. <laughs> and there was no book to speak of, but of the I Sing was a book and it had a story, and it had great ideas, and it was wonderful. The plot lampooned the ineptitude of Congress, the self-importance of the Supreme Court, and the total irrelevance of Vice President Alexander Throttlebottom. The humor of that show still resonates. It still tells you something when you poke fun at the vice president and you poke fun at love and sex in the White House, subjects that have not exactly left us. And now, Mr. President, what do you have to say for yourself? Impeach me, find me, jail me, sue me. My Mary's love means much more to me. Enough, enough, we want no preachment. It's time to vote on his impeachment. It's time to vote on his impeachment. The senator from Minnesota. Guilty. Check. In the spring of 1932, based on its book and lyrics, Of the I Sing became the first musical to win the Pulitzer Prize. While the fictional president, John P. Wintergreen, entertained the public at the Music Box Theater, a Democratic governor from New York, Franklin D. Roosevelt, was elected president. So first of all, let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is Fear itself. He's in Chicago, came up here from Birmingham. Just to see my honey, I'm feeling kind of funny. I There was a color line that existed on Broadway. It didn't get broken for many, many years because the tradition was that black performers should stay in vaudeville or they should stay in minstrel shows or they can do jazz numbers and they can do this, but we don't mix the two races. That was the way it was. It was a, it was a rule. I don't know who made the rule, but it was a rule. Ethel Waters started her career as a teenager, billed as Sweet Mama String Bean. 
Beginning in 1927, she would star in all black Broadway shows like Africana, The Blackbird's Review, and Rhapsody in Black, where she made an astonishing $2,500 a week. Ethel Waters was a big star on black circuits, and she didn't want anyone telling her how to run her act. She wasn't going to do minstrelsy. She wasn't going to play to certain kind of stereotypes. She's always got enormous amounts of what would then be called race pride. When she introduced Stormy Weather in 1933 at the Cotton Club in Harlem, Waters imbued the music with the weight of her own life story. Don't know why there's no sun up in the sky, stormy weather. Since my man and I ain't together, keeps raining on. Ethel came into the world around 1900 after a man raped her mother at knife point and was reared in a Philadelphia ward so poor and violent, it was known as the Bloody Eighth. But singing was her escape. I can't get my poor self together. I'm weary all the time. I can't read music. Never have. My music is all queer little things that come into my head. I feel these little trills and things deep inside of me, and I sing them that way. Ethel Waters. After seeing her nightclub performance, Irving Berlin hired her for his next Broadway review. Berlin was now teamed with the talented young writer Moss Hart. And together, they used the structure of a newspaper with its headlines, gossip and comic strips as the basis for a new show. The review, which had been very light and entertaining in most cases through the 20s, was becoming sharp and politically aware. And Irving Berlin had decided, fittingly given the 30s and this political consciousness that was making its way into popular culture, that he wanted to do a timely review. So he conceived of this as the songs would, each song would be attached to a newspaper headline. There were lots of sketches and lots of songs, and that's what Berlin liked. He was very suspicious of the book musical, or as he called it, the situation show. But give him a review with different songs and different skits, and he was in, in heaven, as he would say in his own song. Ethel Waters, in one show, portrayed everything from an exotic Caribbean dancer who started a heat wave by letting her seat wave to a distraught southern woman singing a lament called Supper Time after her husband has been lynched. The brick wall on the back of the theater was the first set. The entrance of Ethel Waters, this monumental woman had a bandana on her head. She had an apron on. The curtain closes behind her. Behind her was the silhouette of a man hanging from a tree with his head on the side, with the rope around his neck. We didn't know in those days about lynchings in the South. It was very unbelievable that they did it in the first place because you didn't you didn't bring in reality into a, into a musical comedy or a review. It was unheard of. She came forward with the beat of that orchestra, this funk of hers. Oh, and an outspun, and she went into it, and this woman went, Supper time, I must set the table, cause it's Supper time, somehow I ain't able cause that man of mine ain't coming home no more. Supper time, kids, 
will soon be yelling for their supper time. How I keep from telling them that man of mine. If one song can tell the whole tragic history of a race, Supper Time was that song. In singing it, I was telling my comfortable, well-fed, well-dressed listeners about my people. Plant trees in the polo grounds and put Yorkville out of bounds, but please, don't monkey with Broadway. Close the village honky-tonks, suppress cheering in the Bronx, but please, don't monkey with Broadway. Think what names used to dance on this road of romance. Think what stars used to stroll along it all day. Made City Hall a skating rink and push Wall Street in the drink, but please, please, I beg on my knees, don't monkey with old Broadway. To a person who has talent and is willing to work hard, Broadway in New York is as friendly as Main Street in my hometown, Peru, Indiana. Cole Porter. Cole Porter was an enigma to many people. Sophisticated, urbane, dirty. He was determined to become a Broadway writer. He wanted to be like Irving Berlin. He wanted to be like Jerome Kern. At the same time, he was rich and idle and a playboy and liked to be on the Riviera and liked his nice apartment in Paris. So he tried to have both worlds at once, and he got it. In the gloom of the Depression, Cole Porter offered Broadway audiences an escape to a world of refined wit and luxury. A rich Midwestern Episcopalian with a degree from Yale, Porter wrote both music and lyrics. His effervescent songs were a tonic to the struggling nation. And now, ladies and gentlemen, our own version of Cole Porter's Begin the Beguine. 